They live in the 1960s. Nice uh, okay. No, you know, uh, worship is really important here. And it's important because we don't do this really anywhere else other than here once a week. And so it's important that we emphasize and, and devote ourselves to worship Jesus when we have our opportunities. Like this. I haven't said this for a long time. I think maybe it's a good time to do it. We would you just feel free to worship anyone you want to worship. You know, if you want to, if you want to stand, if you want to stand, stand, if you want to sit, sit, if you want to not move like you've been in hairspray, do that. It's okay. You know, you know, we, we don't want to restrict, restrict people in the way they, they worship, worship the Lord because, because it's just really important. important. And, and also, also, I really hope that, that you will uh, join us at the Connecting Point, point class. class. That'll serve as you've been here for a while. Just curious. You want to know what we do, why we do it, what we believe, and that kind of thing. So please, even if you haven't signed up, join us. I've been in California a long time. I'm from the Midwest originally. One thing I've learned over the years is about the time the fourth rainfall hits the road, two things happen. People can't, can't drive. drive. My car has a city of magnet in it and it attracts all crazy drivers. drivers. And, and people, people don't go to church. church. I don't, I don't get, get it. So, so congratulations for being here in this monster train. California is such a mess. <laughs> well, you know, last week, Pastor Jason caught uh, a message out of First Kings about Elijah. It was, it was kind of a fly, fly back. Back. It went so fast, fast and he covered so much ground. ground. He and I were talking this week, week. and we, we thought, thought it might be helpful, helpful. if we, we kind of went back, back and slowed down and kind of focused on some of the details of this story. story. Because, because I think there's, there's a lot of information there that, that you just can't do in one week. week. It's just impossible to do. And so this week and next week, we're going to kind of retrace some of the ground we've already covered last week. And we're, and we're going to try to apply it to our lives today. And I'm going to begin today's message, message with a challenge. I want to challenge you to make a commitment today. Now, now a lot of times they do that at the end of the sermon. I'm doing that right, right at the beginning. I want to challenge you to make a commitment that, that you are going to take a stand for Christ. Whatever, whatever that looks like. Whether it's in good times or bad times. Whether it's in times of plenty or times of not so much. Whether, whether you are supported, supported and encouraged or whether you're opposed or persecuted, it's time to take a stand and serve Jesus wholeheartedly. And if you'll make that commitment, you will be able to say what Jesus himself said just before his, his death as he looked toward heaven and he, looked at, and, and, and he spoke to God the Father and he said, Father, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. We've each been given a work to do, a supernatural endowment, a gift from the Holy Spirit to equip us and enable us and empower us and impassion us to play a part in the greatest endeavor on the earth today, the advancement of God's kingdom and the building of His church. In the weeks and months ahead, I want you to get involved in a ministry, hopefully here, but if not here, somewhere. Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. In the months and weeks ahead, Look for needs that God would use you to meet. Watch for opportunities to serve Him. Make yourself available to God and see what He does. It'll blow your mind. Because I'm convinced God wants to do more through us and with us and in us than we could ever ask or imagine. Paul issued the same type of challenge long ago to the church at Corinth when he said, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. Paul told the church at Corinth, take a stand. The gospel always demands a response. Nobody can hear the gospel. Nobody can get a glimpse of Jesus. Nobody can hear the plan of salvation without a response. And there's only two responses. You either ignore the gospel or you embrace the gospel. You either ignore God's word or you take a stand on the word of God. And I believe as a church, God is calling Oasis to take a stand. And he's saying, are you going to touch your community or are you going to ignore your community? Your family and friends and co-workers and the people you go to school with, the people you live around in your neighborhood. Are you going to help people or are you going to ignore people? Are you going to reach out to lost people or just watch them go to hell? And, and I don't get a sense that there's a, there's a scolding tone 
to that type of a challenge. I think it's, a, it's an exciting type of challenge. I think it's an encouraging type of challenge. That God said, look at who you are. Look at who I made you. I can even use people like you to fulfill my purpose and accomplish my will. God is calling us as a church to take a stand, and he's calling us each as individuals to take a stand too. There comes a point where you've got to draw a line in the sand, you've got to drive a stake deep, and say there's certain things that I will bleed and die for. And first and foremost, it's Jesus. I'm going to take a stand. Am I going to obey or disobey? Am I going to serve or demand that others serve me? Am I going to be a participant? Or, if I, or am I going to be someone who just is a spectator? You know, sometimes we need to be inspired by other people. You know, I love character studies in the Bible because even though there are people like you and I with all the frailties and weakness and failures and sinful nature and everything else, they weren't the superstars. There's only one superstar in this church or any church, and that's Jesus. Even the, the Old Testament saints, the New Testament disciples and apostles, they weren't superstars. They're just fragile people like you and I. But yet, the Bible says that these things are written to encourage us as an example. So I'm going to go back and I want to look at this man named Elijah a man who took a stand in his generation, and, uh, and hopefully he will inspire us to take a stand in ours. But first, just a real brief background, recapping what Jason said last week. Remember, Queen Jezebel is killing all the prophets of God. And there was a man in charge at the king's palace named Obadiah, and he was hiding all the prophets in caves to protect them, to save their life. He, he, he hid all the prophets, all except Elijah. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Right at the beginning of this story, you see two miracles from God each and every day, morning and evening. Bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening. Now, listen, God doesn't always do two miracles a day. It's important that you, you kind of factor that in. A lot of people read stuff like this and they say, well, I, I, God owes me two, two miracles a day. He didn't owe anybody a miracle. God is a debtor to no man. And yet, twice a day, God was through the, the birds of the air speaking to, uh, to Elijah, saying, Elijah, I can be trusted. I am faithful. You've taken your stand. You've surrendered like we sang. You're hungry and I'm going to feed you. And later, God told Elijah, go to a widow's house, and there you'll be fed and you'll be sheltered. And while he was there, the widow's son died, and Elijah prayed, and God raised her son to life, raised him from the dead. And later, we read in chapter 18, after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, now, the famine was severe in Samaria. I, I like to kind of step back. You know, it's important sometimes to linger at certain places in a story, and this is a good place to linger. Take a step back and think what God was doing, unbeknownst to anybody, certainly even unbeknownst to Elijah, but God has been shaping Elijah's character. He's been chiseling some rough edges off. He's been shoring up some weaknesses. He's been preparing Elijah to be used by him sometime in the future. He says, you don't know the future, Elijah, but I do. And I know what you're going to need to carry out my purpose for you in the future, so I'm going to prepare you now. That's what's happening in what we just read. Being fed by the ravens built Elijah's trust in God's ability to provide provision. He, he, God was building his confidence that God can provide. Being cared for by the widow built Elijah's confidence in God's protection because he didn't need to hide him in a cave. He hid him in a widow's house. Raising the young boy from the dead increased Elijah's faith in God's power. So all these events are increasing his trust in God's provision, his confidence in God's protection, and his faith in God's power. 
you know, I think God's doing the same for all of us. And I think we're as oblivious to it as Elijah probably was. I want you to think back. Take a mental inventory of your past. There are plenty of times in the past that God has proven himself faithful to provide, faithful to protect, faithful to empower us when we needed the power. Just like Elijah. And it's important we realize that we're a work in progress. And that God is preparing you today for what He's going to call you to do tomorrow. God's past faithfulness is intended by Him to prepare us for future service. So even when it seems like nothing's going on, even when it seems like your life is dull and mundane and routine and unspectacular, God is still working behind the scenes. And like a master sculptor, He's chiseling off rough edges and He's shoring up weaknesses. And He's establishing confidence in in Him, His ability to provide, to protect, and to empower. So Elijah spent his entire life making himself, making his life available for God to use as He will. And I find it interesting, I don't know if you noticed it, but in 1 Kings chapter 17, God told Elijah, go hide yourself. And in 1 Kings 18, God says, Elijah, go show yourself. Elijah was equally ready to do both. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people who will only let God use them in the private. They want, to, they want God to use them, but they don't want to do anything that's going to draw attention to themselves. And then there's other people who only want to be used in the spotlight. That if people aren't looking and the, the, the crowds aren't applauding and they're not receiving the accolades, they don't really care about being used by God. You know how you can tell when you're really usable to God? When you say, God, you want to use me in private or use me in public? Just use me. Well, now it's time for Elijah to take a stand. So in verse 16, it says, So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summons the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. I want you to try to imagine the scene. It's important when you read the Bible, don't just read words on a page. Don't just try to get to the end of a paragraph. Try to imagine what did it feel like? What did it look like? What did it smell like when these events were taking place? Try to imagine this scene. It's early in the morning. There's no hammer or chisel or plow anywhere in the entire kingdom being used. No work is being done anywhere in the entire nation. And everybody has just a single thought, a common thought. There's only one topic of conversation going on. Why has the king assembled all of us on Mount Carmel? What do you think it is? Something big. Maybe we're going to invade. Maybe we're going to be invaded. Something big is coming. Everybody's saying, why is the king going to shut down his kingdom for a day? And so tens of thousands of people converge on that mountain. And they're all shuffling and pushing and, and trying to get the best vantage point so they can see what's going to happen and hear what's going to be said. And as all this is happening, there's 850 prophets, 450 of Baal and 400 of Asherah, and they, they arrive, and then a king's processional makes its grand entrance with all the pomp and pageantry that royalty would make. And there's an air of electricity as the excitement builds. And there's a, a rumble of conversation and wondering and looking at the king and seeing the prophets and wondering what's going to happen. And then one lonely figure arrives, a prophet of God named Elijah. And every eye turns away from the vast crowd, from the 850 prophets, and even from the king, and all eyes are fixed on one simple man. James said in the New Testament, he was a man just like us. James said it. He was no different than we, we are. He had all the frailties. He was just someone who embraced the gift of God and took a stand. James said he was a man just like us. And when they all see Elijah, there's a hush that falls over the crowd. Because this is the guy whose prayer stopped the rain for three and a half years. And they know he's serious. Everyone knows there's going to be a showdown. It's going to be a public contest. This will be the fight of the century, and it's a winner-take-all. And we read in verse 21, Elijah went before all the people and said, 
How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, follow Him. But the people said nothing. Immediately, Elijah challenges all the people assembled there. He throws down a gauntlet and he said, it's time to take a stand. A choice must be made. He said, divided allegiance is just as bad as open idolatry. Divided allegiance is just as bad as open idolatry. And he says to the people, you must declare yourself for or against the God of Israel. You're either for him or against him. There's no other option with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you know what? There still isn't. There still is no other option. There's two options. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. He said in Matthew 12, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather scatters. You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, not making a decision is making a decision. Failing to decide is deciding to fail. If you don't choose me, you're against me, Jesus said. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to to spit you out of my mouth. And what he's really saying here is that compromise makes God angry, but apathy makes God sick. Sick enough that he will vomit them out of his mouth. This is a real encouraging message, isn't it? Elijah says, it's decision time. Decide for yourself who God really is. And if you haven't made that decision, make it today. He says, decide who God really is and then serve Him. Your life will prove who you believe God is. The way you serve will show how much you love that God. Your outward life declares to everyone what your inward beliefs are. Paul told the, the, the church at Colossians, he said, you are our letter. You're known and read by everybody. You are our letter. Everybody knows who you are. Everybody's reading your life. And you know what they're reading? They're reading whether or not you believe God exists and who you believe that God is and whether or not you're serving Him. Everybody knows. Eliza's challenge was met in this vast multitude of thousands with silence. These people had been undecided for a long time. And now faced with a decision, they retreat back and they seek refuge in their silence. They're waiting to see if somebody else is going to speak up. You know, indecision always paralyzes and silences people. Indecision always paralyzes and silences. The easiest thing to do in a time of decision is to do nothing. That's always the easy path. And that's exactly what the multitudes were doing here in the presence of false prophets, a true prophet, the king, and the nation of Israel. And it says, Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, He is God. And then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah says, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. Which he wasn't. I I know how, how he feels and you do too. You feel like you're the only one, you know. Where are all the other prophets? You remember? They're hiding in caves, afraid for their lives. I want to tell you something. When the fighting begins, hidden prophets aren't much good. When the fighting begins, hidden prophets aren't much good. And hidden disciples aren't much good today either. You can be a believer, you can be a disciple, you can be a follower of Jesus, but if you're not willing to step out into the light, you're not much good. One true prophet of God against 850 prophets. That doesn't look like good odds. Vegas had the points way over the line against Elijah. But anyone who stands with God has the assurance that God will stand with them in the battles of life. Let me say that again. Anyone who stands with God, God will stand with them when life's battles come. And Elijah says, the God who answers by fire, He is God. And I read that and I thought, that's strange. Why not the God who answers by water? 
I mean, that's what they needed. They were in a drought. But you know, you see spiritual truths when you look at things and ask those kind of questions. And, and I realized as I thought about that, spiritual needs are always more urgent than physical needs. They needed to be revived. Not just physically with water, but spiritually with fire. God's fire was going to fall that day, and it was, it was either going to fall in judgment or in revival. Just like today, God's fire comes. It comes in judgment or it comes in revival. And, and Elijah gives the prophets of Baal and Asherah every advantage. You pick the bull. You get to choose two bulls, and then you get to pick which bull you want. You can pray first, and after that, their god Baal, by the way, was known as the god of fire. And it was his way of saying, if your god can't do this, he can't do anything. He's the god of fire. That's why we're doing fire instead of water. And we're told all the people said, what you said, what you say is good. I thought that's just like so many people today. Applauding the truth on Sunday morning, but failing to apply the truth on Monday morning. Remember, they were silent. And now all of a sudden, he's going to fight the fight? He's going to face the, okay, yeah, what you said is good. People hiding in a crowd, cheering on a chance to see a miracle, but never trying to be used by God to perform one. They're shouting for someone else to take a stand, but silent when they were called upon to take a stand of their own. They were the spectators instead of the participants, instead of the players. And so we read, Isaiah, it says, Isaiah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. They called upon the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. They had danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. At noon, after three hours of nothing happening, Elijah begins to taunt them. I can just see his courage kind of, you know, God's already proven that he's going to rescue him and he's, God's already prepared him, and so he begins to taunt them. Certainly your God is God. I mean, you know, maybe he's just deep in thought. He's got a lot on his mind. You know, we've got this famine going on. He's got to figure out how to feed everybody. Maybe he's just distracted. Maybe he's busy. And I looked in the original language, it implies there, maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe your God really is on the throne. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's asleep and needs to be awakened. They shout louder and they slash themselves until the blood flowed. Listen, never mistake zealousness for righteousness. There's some righteous people who are really zeal. Zealous. But there's some zealous people that aren't righteous at all. And too many naive, sincere, but naive Christians think that the people who make the most noise are the most spiritual. Guys on stages that shout and scold and yell. People on street corners. and Hey, God uses people on stages, hopefully. He even uses people on street corners. I'm saying just be wise, be smart. Don't see zealousness as a sign of spirituality. The writer of Romans says, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. After six hours of dancing and shouting and praying and bleeding, there's no response from their God. Let me tell you something. No matter what false religions promise, they only inflict pain, fatigue, and confusion on its followers. 850 prophets. These are the, the big guys of their religion. You know, Satan could have sent fire down. You know that. He could have sent fire down. I know that because in the book of Revelation, speaking of Satan, it says, and he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Satan's already done that. But God's in control on this day. This is his event. And he's not going to let somebody who's willing to take a stand for him fail. God's still in control today. And he 
still won't allow those who are doing his bidding to fail. God is saying, look, I'm trying to show you what I can do with somebody as weak as Elijah. And I'm trying to show you who I am in spite of how weak you are. And if you stand with me, I'll stand with you. If you honor God with your life, God will honor you for a lifetime. All those who cried out to Baal were answered back only with silence. Listen, I don't say very many things that are notable, but you, but you might want to write this down or at least remember it. Any God who is useless in this life is more useless in the life to come. Any God who's useless in this life will be more useless in the life to come. These are desperate people, and these are desperate cries going out to a false god. And I want to tell you, they're still desperate people crying out to false gods today. And they're looking for peace and purpose and hope and joy and meaning and direction in life. And they're sincere and they're crying out, but they're false gods. And so people are bowing down in front of false gods called pleasure, prosperity, power, and popularity. And those things don't provide anything really for this life and certainly nothing for the life to come. Each time the cry goes out for those things, pleasure, prosperity, power, or popularity, no answer is heard. No solutions found. No help is offered. Only silence. When you're lonely, empty, confused, or afraid, those gods fail you every time, but the true God never fails. It says, then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour, in, pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. And water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. After six long hours of failure, by hundreds of false prophets, up steps one true prophet of God. And Elijah says to the people, Everyone come to me. You know, that same message is the message the church should have today. Come to me. I have the answer. I have the solution. I know the answer to your questions, and I know the solution to your problems, and his name is Jesus. Why is the church the hope of the world? Why? Because we are stewards of the gospel the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation, and it's found nowhere else. So not only are we the hope of the world, we're the only hope of the world. Paul told the, the, the Ephesians, God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdoms of God might be known. God created the church on purpose for a purpose, just like he created you on purpose for a purpose. And it's that the manifold wisdoms of God might be displayed to everybody. And that's why the church is so important. And that's why it drives me nuts when people treat it so casually. And if, you know, if you're going to treat this church casually, find one that you can just serve and, and adore and honor. And, and, you know. But for God's sake, don't abandon the church. For God's sake. Notice the first thing that Elijah did. He repaired the altar of God. Now, I want you to notice how he worked. Twelve stones, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. He dug a trench with a specific amount of water in mind. Three seas of seed, whatever the heck that means. 
He arranged the wood a certain way. He cut the bowl just the way the law required for a sacrificial bowl to be cut. Everything was very precise and everything was very deliberate. That tells me that the work of God must not be done carelessly or frantically. It should be done with precision and planning and excellence and in order. Listen, we're not, we're not the best church in the world. We're not even the best church in Redland. But we do our best. And we do it, you know, believe it or not, I'm not just talking off the top of my head. There's been precision and effort and preparation and planning. This, this worship didn't just happen. You know, the, the sound doesn't just automatically turn on when you walk in the door. I mean, people have, have been very precise in planning. We do to the degree of excellence that we, we can. Jeremiah, another prophet, said, a curse on him who is lax in doing the Lord's work. Paul told his young son in the faith, Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Paul told the Corinthians, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Don't be a casual Christian. Don't be frantic. If you commit yourself to serving Jesus, then serve well. Over the years, people have said things to me, and I know they're well-intended, and, you know, if you've said this to me, sorry, I didn't know you were here, I wouldn't say this. People say, you know, you really need to let the Spirit flow. Just let the Spirit lead you. Just leave your notes. And I think, man, the Spirit's been leading me all week. And if He wants me to leave the notes, I'll leave the notes. I do every week anyway. But somehow some people think the only way the Spirit leads is spontaneously. He does things decently and in order, fittingly, with precision and a commitment to excellence. And he makes up what's lacking, and he uses foolish people to confound the wise, and he uses weak people to display his strength. And yet we do our part, and he does his part. But there is a part that we play. And yes, God leads through the Spirit spontaneously, but most of the time, God leads through diligence and hard work and precision and effort. Elijah pours 12 barrels of water over the wood and the sacrifice and the altar. You know why he did that? The altars of Baal, the god of fire, were built a certain way with compartments that they would light on fire. And at just the right time, the fire would come up and burn the sacrifice, and they would give the credit to Baal as the god of fire. And Elijah wanted everyone to be absolutely certain who was about to send fire. And it wasn't Baal, and it wasn't the altar. And notice what he prayed for. He didn't pray for rain. He prayed for two things the honor of God and the salvation of people. That's what churches should be devoting their lives to. That's what Christians should be devoting their lives to. God's honor and people's salvation. And he says in his prayer, God, let them know everything I've done had nothing to do with me. It was at your word. It was your orders. I wasn't being foolish. I wasn't being presumptuous. I wasn't being casual or careless. I was being obedient. And guess what? The fire fell. God's honor was restored in Israel. And Elijah is still remembered today. We're talking about him thousands of years later. All because he was willing to do three things. To make a commitment, to take a stand, and to get involved. That's it. That's all God needs. So, the question remains. I'll, I'll end with this. Let's say I've convinced you through the foolishness of preaching, the Spirit did something and said, okay, I'll sign me up. Show me a false prophet of Baal and I'm going to go punch him in the nose. How do we take a stand today? First, determine and be committed that you are going to take a stand. Take some risks. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Do what you've never done before. Go where you've never been before. Try what you've never tried before. And if you've tried it in the past and it didn't work, try it again. That's called walking by faith. Become known as a servant of God by serving people. So I said, get involved in the ministry. Ministry is all about people. You take the people out of the ministry, there's no ministry. If this room was empty, I'm just talking. Serve God by serving people. Jesus said, when you've done whatever you do with a pure heart because of your love for me, to even the least of these, you've done it unto me. And when you don't do it, you didn't do it to me. 
Determine that you're going to take a stand. Become known as a servant of God because you serve people. Stand alone even when other people are silent or watching. Listen, right is right even if nobody else is doing it. And wrong is wrong even if everybody else is doing it. You stand alone. Now we lock arms instead of locking horns. We stand together, but ultimately each of us stand alone. Put God's honor ahead of your own ease, comfort, or reputation. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will fall into place. If we place God's honor and his purpose ahead of our own reputation, comfort, or ease, he'll take care of the rest. Finally, seek the salvation of people who don't know Jesus. There's people that you know right now that with your silence or with your compromised example of a life, you're punching their ticket to hell. You're pointing them the way and saying, I'll buy the first tank of gas. But if we reach out to those people that we know don't know Jesus or people who even think they know Jesus but really don't, maybe God has positioned you in their life so he can use you to transform their life. And not just the people you know. There's people that you're going to meet this week, next week, next month who just need an example of a real, authentic Christian. Somebody who really cares. Somebody who admits their faults. Somebody who is non-judgmental and non-critical. That doesn't mean you agree on everything. That doesn't mean you never confront sin because you always confront sin. It's just don't confront sin like a jerk. Jesus didn't. I love what he said to the woman caught in the act of adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. He didn't condemn her, but he didn't condone her. He called it sin and told her to quit it. But he did it in a way that made her want to change. Determine you're going to take a stand today. Become known as a servant of God because you serve people. Stand alone when you have to. Put God's honor above your own comfort, ease, or reputation. And be used of God to take the gospel to people that need them. Become a fully devoted follower of Christ. And I'll tell you what that means if you join us in the class after this service. And I can tell you this, through scripture, through other people's testimony, and through personal experience, if you commit yourselves to those things, stand back and watch the fire fall. Let's pray. Father, I pray that somehow you would ignite the fires that have dimmed in our own hearts and lives and minds and souls and reignite that which has been reduced down to a flicker. Lord, help us to practically take a stand in a timely, relevant, practical way in our own lives. Lord, we just want to offer ourselves to you and say, use us. Glorify yourself through us. Let your strength be seen in our weakness. Let your, let your wisdom be seen in our foolishness, Lord. Father, we just ask that your will would be done in this church and in all the churches that sincerely seek you the lives of every believer who desires to follow you. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.